Okay. Welcome everyone to our third meeting of our 2021 virtual meeting series for the Fabric community. And this time we're very fortunate to have Dr. Rob Hopkin talking about gene therapy for Fabry disease. And if Dawn um, shows up in just a minute, Doc, Dawn is going to do the formal uh, introduction of Dr. Rob and, and tell you a little bit about him. But I'll go ahead and uh, do these slides first this time and see if Dawn appears. And then if she doesn't, I'll do the formal introduction and we'll, be, and we'll get going. So the first thing we'd like to do is just share with you. So as a nonprofit, you know, we have uh, sponsors that sponsor our programs and services. And so we'd like to do two things in these meetings is we don't want to have such a long meeting that they all come and talk like we do at our conference. But we'd like to just share some highlights and not just for their benefit, but for the community's benefit of what's going on out there in industry, just a, a bullet for each of the companies that um, sponsor our programs and, and have information that we'd like you to know about and stay up to date with. So this is a slide that I put together. It's just a one bullet per company. And so you know, things that they would like us to highlight. And you can either take a picture of this slide or you can just wait for the recording to come out and um, see it in the recording where you can stop it and write any information down that you'd like to either way. So as you can see, Sandipede Genzyme has a couple of uh, websites that they just want to make sure everyone is aware of. Amicus has the same and Amicus um, has a patient meeting uh, uh, on females coming up soon. KAC has there is initiated the rethink program if you haven't heard about that. It's a website and a whole host of uh, things that go along with that resources that they share and um, Avro bio is um, in, cl in clinical trials. So they're looking for people to participate in clinical trials as are San Gamo and 40 MT. So there's uh, several clinical trials going on right now. So if you're interested in any of that uh, contact with those uh, clinical trials, contact your physician and, and, and some of those links have a direct number that you can call to get information. And then at the, um, I skipped to Dorcia because their uh, clinical trial enrollment is completed, but I just, uh, they weren't grouped with the others. I didn't skip them uh, because they don't have, whoops, they don't have uh, valuable information to share. So uh, Dorcia has um, finished enrollment and they're on their way to collecting and anal analyzing data for a potential approval. So that is a, a slide just for reference that you can go back to in the, in the recording if you'd like. Next slide I've got is we put a place on our website for you to be able to go to find information on, as you can see, if you look at the top menu bar, you can select the last tab and find pharmaceutical industry information, clinic information, and support organization, organization information. And if you look at those two examples below it, you'll see that each person, each organization has a grid and you can find all the resources that they're offering to the community, or at least what they think are the best representations and also information on some of the things we're doing and the other, the support organizations like the financial assistance programs for PSI and PAN and TAF and TAF. And so there's um, three different sections there that you can go in and find out uh, what you're looking for, financial assistance programs and, and um, other things. The next slide is we have almost a thousand calendars yet to distribute. So one of the things we'll do is you'll get a calendar for participating in this event. And if you've been to one or two of the, the first two, then you already have a calendar um, should be in the process of getting to you uh, in the mail. So we'll continue that and everybody will have their um, symptoms calendar. And, and I think as a lot of you know, this is also a symptoms presentation on our website without all the calendar pages if you want to share it with someone or, or help to educate your family and friends and even doctors appreciate seeing our version of all of the or most of the common symptoms of Fabry disease. So next slide. 
and you know, just before I leave, and clinics will send these to clinics also as examples for their patients. And the last thing is just on the registration page that you registered on, each time we finish a meeting, like we're doing with this meeting now, then we'll uh, close that link and we'll open the link to the next meeting. So it's always going to be the same place that you go to register for the series of 21 meetings in, in 2021. That was just an accident, by the way, the, the number. We just missed out on the first couple in the beginning of the year. I should have told you that. Anyway, all right, so that is the, I'm gonna stop sharing. Well, actually, I'm gonna share something else. So let me, Dawn, are you here yet? No. No dawn, so let me carry on. I, I have to pull up a website that I wasn't prepared to pull up, so give me just a second. So what I'm doing now while you're waiting is Joe going back into the registration website and opening it up and selecting the speakers and bios tab. And I'm just going to scroll down to uh, Dr. Hopkins. Dr. Hopkin, I like, I accidentally put an S on his name like everyone tries to do with my name. So uh, I get that uh, part of it. So Dr. Rob Hopkin, what can we say? He is uh, so active in the fabric community and has made so many contributions that um, it's just hard to believe really. And beyond what you'll read and things like this where, you know, we give, him, we give you the, the, the professional scoop, a brief version of it, um, you know, being a, a MD and associate uh, professor and runs the, you know, Fabric Clinic in, in Cincinnati, Children's Hospital in Cincinnati, and all sorts of other things and publishes so many papers. And, and this tells kind of about his interests and, and once a one over on uh, a little bit about Dr. Hopkin. But our story with Dr. Hopkin goes far beyond what you see on this slide. But did I even share it yet? No. Um, you're not looking at what I'm looking at. Sorry. This was the part of my uh, presentation that I was hoping just to um, have a Dawn navigate because I'm so, so awful at uh, navigating screen sharing and everything. So this is what I've been looking at. And it's Dr. Hopkins bio that which you can see on the speakers and bios page on the website along with Dawn's and mine and many and any of the speakers that we have in this series. So in addition, Dr. Hopkin is the, um, the chair of our medical advisory board. And he is, he is the only physician that um, he's our si sidewalk consultant at our annual camp at Victory Junction. So every year, you know, the last uh, year we didn't have it because of COVID, but every year since we started camp, Dr. Hopkin and he spends that the conference and the weekend camp with us and goes around answering questions for people all the time he's there. And he's just as, a, just as I said, he's a sidewalk consultant. And he goes above and beyond in so many ways. And the parts that I like to talk about are the, the parts of him uh, doing a handstand over home plate in, in the uh, stadium and things like that. But he does so much and participates in all the activities and it's just one, uh, it's nice to be able to see that side of some of the people that work so closely with us and with the community. And in addition to all the clinical work and all the patients he sees and helps and papers he writes and goes above and beyond in, in all respects. So we really appreciate Dr. Hopkins support and his uh, presentation tonight. So let me uh, stop this and Another note is a little bit later after the presentation, we're going to ask you to um, put something, put a, a word in your in the chat box so that we can do a prize drawing. So uh, we'll do, Dr. Hobson is going to speak, then we're going to do a uh, question and answer session. So write down your questions and we don't, you don't have to wait to write down your questions as you think of them, just put them in the chats. Um, button at the bottom of your screen and then we'll collect those and ask Dr. Hopkin questions after we finish the presentation. So with that, I'm going to, uh, I don't have, 
I'm off of screen share, so I think I'm okay. And I'm gonna give you to uh, Dr. Hopkin. Thank you very much. If Brenda can uh, share, I'll let uh, Dr. Hopkin have screen share, we'll be all set. All right. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Excellent. So we are, as was already mentioned, we're going to be talking about gene therapy. I'll talk a little bit about some things that are related to gene therapy and then talk specifically about gene therapies uh, for Fabry disease. And then we'll have, I think, plenty of time open for questions and answers. if I can figure out how to get this to. There we go. So gene therapies, genetic therapies are different in some ways than gene therapy. So genetic therapies are therapies that are based on the genetics of the condition uh, that you're trying to treat. And that would include things like stem cell therapy where we put in cells that don't have the disorder. And we do treat some lysosomal storage diseases with that. Um, organ replacement therapy, which is commonly used to treat symptoms of Fabry disease, but is not at least currently an effective way of addressing the global disorder of Fabry disease because Fabry disease involves the heart, the kidneys, the nervous, the peripheral nerves, the eyes, and you just can't transplant all of those things. There are other ways that we use genomic or genetics to make therapies. So transgenomics, where we take something that the body needs or that we want to provide to somebody for a therapy, and we grow that in other cells. So not in, we don't give it to people. We don't use human cells to produce it, but we use bacteria or hamster ovaries or yeast or insects or carrot plants or other things and produce the product that we need and then give that to people. And those are all both genetic therapies. Gene therapy is also a genetic therapy, but gene therapy, you take the gene itself that isn't functioning and you either fix it so that it will function or you replace it with a new copy of that gene and allow it to produce. And that comes in a couple of different varieties. We'll talk more about that later. So stem cell therapies or transplants, hemopoietic Pluripotent stem cells are what we use for bone marrow transplant. Um, and that takes the stem cells that are not differentiated into specialized cells and they go into the body and the, those cells then become white blood cells, glial cells, which are um, cells that support the nerve cells in the brain osteoclasts, which are in bones, and other cell types. So those are, they can get into a lot of different tissues in the body and do their job. So if we can replace those cells, uh, then that can be an effective therapy. And that is used, for example, in Hurler syndrome or MPS1. And it can be used to treat Gaucher disease which has a lot of, of blood-related uh, abnormalities, but that has not been um, well-studied in people. We can also use stem cells. So those hem hematopoietic means blood-making um, stem cells, and those cells are partially differentiated at the time that we see them. 
embryonic or totipotent stem cells are cells that have no specialization and that can become any kind of cell in your body. And those are a lot harder to get and a lot harder to use uh, for, for therapies, but are something that there's a lot of research being done on. And there's been some actually some kind of exciting um, new developments in that because they have been able to make embryonic, they've been able to take cells that were differentiated. So for example, from a skin biopsy and treat them and convert them into embryonic stem cells now in a laboratory setting. Whether those will eventually be able to be used to replace scarred heart tissue or other damaged um, cells in your body remains to be seen. Now, other stem cells, cells that are going to be predisposed to make nerve cells or things like that are also being looked at and studied, but not ready for the most part uh, for use in treating people at this point. Now, other ways that we can use cell therapies, you can do whole organ transplants. So Jerry mentioned that he has a new heart. Um, there are people who have, probably several people listening here may have kidney transplants, and there are other organs that can be transplanted as well. The challenge with that right now is that you have to get those organs from somebody. And for something like a heart, that's a big deal. A kidney, you have two of those, but it's still a big deal because there's a big surgery that goes along with that. Now, there are people working on being able to take cells, like I mentioned before, take cells that would be maybe skin cells, make cells that can then differentiate into any organ we want, and then help them to differentiate and use in a laboratory, grow a new organ to replace one. That is, again, it's something that could be useful for Fabry disease, but would not at this point be a complete treatment for Fabry disease. Um, and that would get into either cell replacement where you program the cells and then put them in and they go in and grow into the organ that's damaged or making whole new organs. That is future aspirations at this point. Um, and this is just looking at some of the steps in that, but we'll skip that. Now, one of the things that's really important about genetics and the stuff that we need to do to successfully replace genes is that the genetic code that we use is the same for every kind of life that we are aware of. So archaebacteria, which are more primitive than regular bacteria, regular bacteria, yeast, plants, all animals, and even viruses use the same genetic code that we do for all of their genes. Furthermore, going all the way back to archaebacteria, there are some genes that have enough overlap in the way they function that they can be changed between organisms and still potentially work. Now, you may be thinking, I don't want any bacteria genes in my body. I don't want any viruses in my body. The thing is, we are actually dependent on those structures. There are things like mitochondria in your body that are essential for your life that we think started off as bacteria that invaded bodies. And then it was a mutually beneficial thing until the two kind of fused together. 
And some of our DNA in the nuclei of our cells is derived from viruses, but is really important in some of the complex regulation of different cell types within our bodies. So we, we actually do have the opportunity to use genetics that overlaps between species and even between plants and animals and fungus and animals and all the different kinds of life forms. But we have to do that carefully. We have to know what we're doing to be able to do that successfully. So this is just another way of emphasizing that concept, showing pictures of a lot of different kinds of life and a lot of you know things as far back as dinosaurs are using the same genetic codes and had genes that overlapped in function and structure to what we have. And all of the forms of life are like that. So people have been thinking about gene therapy almost from the time that genes were discovered. So you go back to Watson and Crick when they were figuring out that DNA was the instruction manual for life. And since that time, people have been fantasizing about gene therapy. In fact, when I was in high school, I don't remember which grade I was in, but I was in high school, I was assigned to write a term paper and I wrote a term paper on the ethics involved in gene therapy and what were the risks and potential benefits and was it worth taking that risk? And I have a copy of that term paper in a box someplace in my house still. Um, and it talks about some things that are actually still challenges. Now, that was a long, long time ago. And we still don't have gene therapies for most of the genetic conditions. It turns out that there's a lot of complexity in the way our bodies protect themselves from invasion and in the regulation of genes. They're not simple recipes. So the implications of this idea that we all have the same genetic code is that any organism can read the code from another organism most of the time. And that any organism has the machinery to express genetic sequences. And as we talk more about some of the options that we can use, you will come to realize that that's really important. The effector molecules or proteins can be produced by any organism because the translation from DNA to RNA to proteins is the same between species. So because of that, we have learned to manipulate some genes. So quite a while ago now, we learned how to clone mammals, or animals. And there are a lot of them that have been cloned. Um, Dolly the sheep was sort of the first one and very famous, but now we've cloned sheep, goats, cows, mice, monkeys, um, kangaroos, frogs, lizards, lots of plants. And, you know, the, and we've been able to then sequence and study these, gene, these organisms in ways that weren't able to do before. And there are lots of scientific questions we can answer more effectively that way because we can have identical or nearly identical um, organisms and do different things to them and see what results are of that. There are also lots of commercial applications 
to cloning and to the tissue culture process that is involved with that. So use of one of the other things that has come up, and this is something where enzyme replacement therapies became possible because we can do this, is using the cells of plants and animals to farm or to make drugs. So using farming techniques to make pharmaceuticals and growing cells. So, um, you know, in enzyme therapies, there are companies that use modified human cells to make enzyme. There are companies that use other species of mammal cells. There are companies using plants. And there have been experiments in using things like bugs to grow uh, enzyme. And um, also that have done things like grow, uh, well, let's see. So this is looking at plants and they don't grow. So if you look on here, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but if you look on here, uh, this kind of a plant is not usually a whole plant isn't how they're doing it currently. What they do is take cells from a plant, put them into a solution and grow those. And then they can control the, the traits and collect off the proteins that they produce more easily. They can also do that with animal cells. And that's how we usually do it is tissue culture. But there are people who are working on taking whole animals, keeping them intact, and then having them produce proteins that we want in the milk so that we don't have to harm the animals to use the animals to produce medications that we need to treat human diseases. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. We're here to talk about replacing genes. So gene therapy, we take a gene and we have, and we want to take, make copies of the gene, insert them into cells in our bodies and have them work for us to replace things that we are missing or to modify the expression of something if we, if we aren't missing it, but it's not produced in adequate amounts. There are a couple of ways to do that. Germline gene therapy, we change the cells that we use to reproduce. So in that case, if you fixed something in an embryo and changed all of the cells in the embryo, that would that corrected copy of the gene would be passed down to future generations. And there are some people who are who think that is too scary because what if something goes wrong with the copy or what if it gets inserted in a place that disrupts another gene and causes a problem? But it is something that is being considered. More commonly, when we talk about gene therapy, we're not talking about changing every cell in the body and we're specifically not talking about the cells that produce eggs and sperm. We're talking about changing the cells that are impacted directly by the condition we're trying to, to treat. So, or that are, or other cells that can produce the thing that we need in the, in the body. That's called somatic cell therapy. Somatic cells are the cells that are in our body, but are not used to reproduce and make the next generation of humans. But just the cells that we use in our muscles, hearts, kidneys, intestines, nervous system, et cetera. And what we try to do in that is get, the, get enough cells into the organs that are affected by a disease um, that can make the missing product that they can supply the cells around them. And that works very well for things 
where you have a free floating protein that can be transferred from one cell to another. And on some level, Fabry disease is thought to be one of those things. So what do you need for gene therapy? First, you need to have a gene. Now a gene is like a recipe uh, for making a protein, but you don't just need the list of ingredients. That's the coding sequence. But you have to also have promoters which prepare the cell to make that protein. And then you have to have the coding sequence that tells you what ingredients to put in. So what amino acids to put into the protein. Then after you've put all of that chain of amino acids together, you have to fold it and clip it and add stuff to it and decorate it and make it presentable. So like if you're making a birthday cake, you don't just mix up the batter and then hand that to the birthday person. You have to mix up the batter, put it in the cake pan, bake it, take it out, put the icing on it, put whatever decorations you're going to on it, then you present it to somebody. And our bodies do that with the proteins that we make as well. That process turned out when I wrote my first, you know, my high school term paper on gene therapy, they thought they could just clip the gene and drop it into the cell and it would be good. And they tried that and nothing happened. And now we are 40 plus years later and we're just starting to figure out all the details of what has to happen to get that to work. The other thing you need is a way of inserting a gene into the cell. And this is one of the places where the fact that our genetic code between all forms of life appears to be the same is really important. Now, one of the things about viruses that when I'm getting a cold, I hate, but that when I'm trying to invent a new therapy I like is that viruses are really good at getting into our cells. They have a shell around them that is designed to insert into the cell membranes and then inject the genetic material that's contained in it into the cell and kind of take over the cell and make it produce, make it activate those genes and produce those gene products. So if we want an efficient way of getting a gene dropped into a cell, can we use viruses? And we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the answer bottom line is we can but we have to modify those viruses because as you know, and especially this year, as you know, viruses can make you sick and we don't wanna make people sick when we're trying to treat their disease. So we have to make, we have to take away the ability of viruses to cause infection, but keep the outside portion of the virus that will insert the genetics into the nucleus of the cell appropriately. And that can be done either in our bodies, which is called in vivo or in a living creature, or we can do it ex vivo, where we take cells that we want to transform out of the body, treat them with gene therapy, and then put them back into the body. Now, there are other methods of getting um, DNA into cells. We can use liposomes, naked plasmids, and other similar kinds of um, biologic machinery 
to transport things into cells, but those are not well developed enough to be used practically at this time for gene therapy. So when you are making a gene therapy, what you want to do is take the gene, which is on in the little flask, you see the coils of DNA here, you take the gene, you process it a little bit, you inject it into cells and get it to be produced, and then you harvest out that, and then you package it into um, viruses, and then you use the virus carriers to go into cells and get the cells, the person's cells to produce whatever that gene is. Now that is not a super efficient pro process. So we cannot go into any organism and give them gene therapy and have every cell in their body get exactly one copy of whatever the gene is. We throw a bunch of gene of the vector in to the body and you'll have some cells that get multiple copies of that gene. Some cells don't get any copies of that gene. And we just hope that enough of them get it and that the production of the gene product is good enough to meet the needs of the body. So the ideal gene therapy, you would have a gene that you can make that directly fulfills a need in the individual you're treating, you would be able to target that so that that gene is integrated to a specific site where you know it won't cause problems and where there is enough regulatory elements in the DNA to make that gene function appropriately. You would be able to do that one time and have that gene then function in the body throughout the lifetime of, of the patient. And it would have to not have any side effects. Now, you guys have all taken medicines before, and you know that there are no medicines that are that good. There's always some potential side effects. There's always some off-target effects. But what we're trying to do is get it close enough to this ideal that we can do it safely, effectively, and have it be a better option than remaining sick. And one of the ways that we have to do that is to get the target, you know, get the gene into a place that we want it to go. Now, not all viruses infect the same types of cells. So we want to take advantage of viral tropism. Viral tropism is the tendency for certain viruses to target specific kinds of cells. So we know, for example, that herpes viruses and rabies viruses are really good at getting into nerve cells. But it might make you nervous to think about having herpes or rabies injected into your body. We'll talk about how we deal with that issue later. Um, HIV virus is really good at getting into the immune system. Adenovirus, really good at getting into the lungs. Adeno-associated virus, there are about 10 types at least. And adeno-associated virus is a little bit unique in that all of the ones above that on this list cause diseases in people. Adeno-associated virus was found accidentally when they were looking for adenovirus. Um, and it had some structural simul similarities, but it doesn't usually cause human disease 
or if it does, it's very mild human disease. But there are forms of adeno-associated virus that are that have tropism for the liver, for the nervous system, for kidneys, for hearts, etc. And there are some that are polytropic, meaning they will go into multiple different organs in the body. And we want to take advantage of that when we're designing gene therapy so that we can target the organs that we want to produce. Um, in this case, the alpha galactosidase A enzyme. So there are lots of types of viruses. These are just a few of them, but these are the ones that have been most closely looked at for the purpose of um, gene therapies. So retroviruses, lentiviruses are a subset of retroviruses, but they're RNA-based. So the genetic material is carried on RNA. The RNA is injected by the virus into the cell, transported into the nucleus, and then the virus itself has um, enzymes in it that translate the um, RNA into DNA, and then they integrate that into the cellular DNA, and then this, the viral DNA that has now been become part of the organism then takes over control of the cells in the natural process. The adenoviruses and adeno-associated viruses do not integrate into the individual's chromosomes or their normal nuclear DNA, but they do go into the nucleus of the cell and take advantage of the machinery that's in the nucleus of the cell to produce the products of the genes that they carry. So this is what happens when you take a virus. So in this case, it's a retrovirus. The LTR is um, sort of maintenance material that's in the virus. And then in the middle, you have that gag, pole, ENV stuff. Those are genes in the virus that the virus needs to take over the cell. We don't want those because they make it so the virus can self-replicate and that leads to damage to the cells that the virus has entered. So what we do is go in to the viral genetic material and cut those parts out. And then we drop in the gene that we want to be expressed to make gene therapy. So when you have the viral capsid um, that you that is used for gene therapy, you do not put in the genes that are needed for the virus to reproduce, but you do drop in the gene that you want to be produced along with the um, instructions that tell the nucleus of the gene how to initiate activity of the gene of interest that we dropped in. Now we, there is, depending on the, the type of virus, there's huge variability in how big of a piece of DNA you can drop in. So um, adenovirus can only take small genes. Adeno-associated virus can take a little bit bigger genes. Lentivirus, a little bit bigger than that, probably most genes. And herpes virus can actually take in multiple genes at a time, potentially. Um, and people are, because of those, that carrying capacity, people are looking at those, at each of those viral types for ways of developing gene therapy. But there are some additional challenges. And this was stuff 
that was not anticipated in um, humans or when, when we first thought of putting genes into humans. Humans, chimpanzees, and other monkeys share most of their DNA. More than 90% of their genes are identical if you just look at the coding portion of the gene. However, humans, chimpanzees, and other primates look very different. They function very differently. They're not interchangeable. And it has taken a long time to figure out what made that difference. Now, in our genes, about 1% of our genes is what we call coding DNA. And that is the DNA that specifies which amino acids to put in proteins in the body. That other 99% of our DNA, when I was in medical school, we were told that that was junk DNA, that most of it we could just cut out and get rid of and we wouldn't miss it. That turns out to be quite mistaken because that's where the instructions um, for gene expression and the regulation of gene expression is, is housed. So the things that differentiate us from other animals and to some extent even from plants is in that space between the genes. We're just starting to understand that portion, which makes it hard because we don't know which parts of the DNA are most critical to regulate a gene and get it to function appropriately or normally. We're just starting to get a handle on that. Uh-oh. I don't know what I did wrong here. I think you can just select the slide you were on and then restart the uh, presentation. Okay. I think. <laughs> You're probably right. Okay, let's go here. Yep. So I don't know how I did that, so hopefully I won't do it again. So anyway, they there have been some studies done looking at this genetic regulatory mechanism. And what they found is that up to 40% of the differences in the way the genes behave and that result in clearly recognizable differences between people and chimpanzees and Reese's monkeys are done through epigenetic regulatory mechanisms. So epigenetics are chemicals that are attached to our DNA that keep the DNA folded appropriately. And methylation, high degrees of methylation typically shut genes off. Acetylation turns genes on and there are a host of other things. We're not gonna go into, this isn't a biochemistry class, but there are ways that your body turns genes on and off. And there are places where those attachments are supposed to be and where they're not supposed to be. And that's all a highly integrated, highly regulated system. Okay, this is just a citation saying where that information came from. So now we're gonna go back to Dolly. I talked about how we can use cloning. So why don't we just clone new people or clone new parts of people? And the answer is that when we do, there are big important errors that occur. So when Dolly was made, she aged much faster than a normal sheep would. 
And in fact, there has never been a cloned animal that was truly normal because that disrupts these regulatory mechanisms. So one of the things that we have to learn to do with gene therapies is not go in and disrupt the regulatory mechanisms that keep our whole bodies functioning normally. And we make, our bodies make about 100,000 different chemicals and we need them in the right place at the right time in the right ratios or things don't work well. So if we go in and try to do genetic manipulations without knowing what we're doing, the chance is very high that we will have problems. And in fact, things like causing cancer or causing dementia were predicted back in the 60s when people first started talking about gene therapy. And in the first trial of gene therapy that was successfully done, uh, they did it, it was, you know, they got the gene in, the people got better from the disease they were treating, which was SCID, which is a very severe immunodeficiency, but more than 50% of the people treated in that trial got cancer. And it was the same kind of cancer, and it was because of the way they had done the treatment. So then they shut down all gene therapy trials for several in people for several years while people went back to figure out how can we do this without causing cancer. And it turns out that you have to target that trial was done with random integration and they broke a lot of genes in ways that were important. And that led to dysregulation of cell growth. So now when we target uh, gene integration, we do, we have specific areas of, of the gene, of, of the chromosomes in mind that we can kind of, it's not 100% targeted, but it's much more likely to go into safe places and to integrate in a way that does not disrupt the function of other genes. So therapy, challenges of gene therapy, we have to target the delivery of the genes. We have to deal with the immune response generated from the vectors especially when we use viral vectors. We have to be able to regulate the expression of the genes because some genes can be expressed in high amounts and it's safe, but some genes too little or too much can cause problems. We have to be able to select the right tissues in the right places and then another thing that I had never considered until fairly recently, but that has been pointed out as a big challenge to gene therapy is if you only treat people one time, how do companies stay in business? Because it takes a lot of investment and a lot of money to create a gene therapy. How do you maintain that? as a business model. We're not gonna talk about that last one, but it is an important concept. So essential elements for treatment, you have to understand, you have to identify a disease and know what that disease looked like in an untreated condition. Then you have to understand what underlies the, what's causing that phenotype. Then you have to have a target for what you want the treated people to look like that's a measurable outcome. And that's, need, that's essential for doing clinical trials. 
because you can't do a clinical trial for 40 years. You have to have a shorter term than that. And then you have to have successful targets for treatment that are measurable, but that actually fix the disease and that you can use as long-term measures of success. And then you have to know which parts of that condition are completely corrected, which are partially corrected, and which are not helped. Most of the time, in fact, for every treatment that we have to date, for every disease that we have to date, there are some aspects of the conditions that are not fully treated. So we, we can cure some things functionally, but so far genetic conditions are generally improved with our treatments, but not cured. And so what do we follow up on to make sure we're treating it? Okay, now we're gonna talk a little bit about Fabre disease um, in general, and then we'll start talking about specific attempts to do gene therapy for Fabre disease. So some of the challenges of Fabre disease is it involves multiple organs, and the cell types in those organs are highly varied. So targeting, for example, um, the heart will only treat part of Fabre disease is not adequate. Targeting kidneys, similar. Targeting heart and kidneys would require two different techniques. So we need to find ways of being able to get expression of the gene so that it's available in multi-organs, multi-tissues, multi-cell types. Another thing that is complex about Fabre disease is that it's an enzyme and enzymes are often shared between cells in an organism. But for some reason, our bodies do not share alpha galactosidase A between cells very efficiently. So they don't cross correct if we're producing a typical normal amount of that enzyme. There are big differences between men and women in how Fabry disease is expressed. So we need to be able to, to address the needs of men and women. Sometimes they're gonna overlap, but there's not complete overlap in that. And it's a very slowly progressive disease, which makes designing clinical trials on treatment of Fabry disease very difficult. Because as I said before, you can't do a 40 year clinical trial and hope to have a profitable business from that. But there are some good things about Fabry disease. One is that alpha galactosidase A is not membrane bound. So it can be transferred between cells under certain circumstances. The enzyme is also relatively small, which makes it easier to construct vectors that can carry that into the body for gene therapy. The other thing that's really beneficial is that overexpression. If we make too much enzyme in some cells, that does not seem to have any side effects. So we don't have to downregulate expression uh, for this particular condition. Um, and while Fabry disease is rare, it is not so rare that there are too few patients to have a viable, sustainable market for a, a product. Now, we have a couple of kinds of vectors that people are using for Fabry disease. Adeno-associated virus, so the AAV viruses, and they're using two, six, eight, and nine at least have been um, 
looked at for delivering um, the gene. Uh, and they, because the different ones are used because they have different tropism and target different tissues effectively. So there are people specifically trying to optimize the expression in the heart. There are people who are targeting the liver because the liver produces high volumes of some proteins that are and exports them to the rest of the body. So things like albumin are made in the liver. So if we can take advantage of the liver's capacity to do that, then we can produce lots of enzyme and have it circulate throughout the rest of the body. That could be a good thing. Um, and that one would be an in vivo approach. The other groups, there are several groups looking at lentiviral vectors. Lentivirus are RNA to DNA viruses. They integrate into the chromosomal DNA. And once a, a cell has been treated, that cell will be, it will be integrated into the DNA of that cell. So every time that cell divides, the offspring cells will also have that gene in them and being expressed and regulated in a similar way to what the parent cell had, which means if you get it into cells that are increasing in number, then it will increase in the ability to produce the enzyme throughout the life of, of the patient, potentially. And lentiviral um, gene therapies have good long-term stability. Usually, lentiviral gene therapy is done as an ex vivo treatment. Um, so you take cells out of the body, treat them, and then you put the cells back into the body. So now let's talk about some specific ones. ST920 is in clinical trials. This is the, I think, I believe this is the one that Sangamo is doing, although I'm not 100% of sh sure of that at this moment. I should be. Yes, but... that's, that's true. Okay. So this is an AAV, and it's a hybrid of two and six um, in vivo delivery, and it specifically targets the liver and basically tries to turn the liver into an alpha galactosidase A um factory without disrupting the normal business that the liver needs to do um, this approach has the theoretic capacity to produce high levels of enzyme production to export using the liver's natural machinery into the circulation and it would if it's successful it will be like um having ERT running into your body all the time so that there is always enzyme available for cells that need it and they just take it up. But this, one of the downsides of this approach is that um, getting the enzyme into the circulation will target all of the tissue types that are well targeted by ERT, but will probably not get great penetration into the nervous system and may not get adequate penetration into some other uh, cell types and tissue types. Uh, this kind of gene therapy has been well tolerated um, in the other diseases that it has been tested for. And at this point for Febre disease, only a handful of patients have been treated and they haven't had long-term follow-up. So this is very exciting and it is actively being done in people, but it's not one that I can tell you how successful it is yet. Actually, that's going to be the case for all of the ones that we talk about. 
Okay, this is another one that's a, a new um, concept. So this one is um, AAV9 administer, administered, and this um, particular form of gene therapy is being developed specifically because of the polytrophic nature of this particular AAV9 variant. It goes into, as you can see on the pictures, it goes into the brain, the spinal cord, the liver, the heart, the kidneys, and other tissues. So it can get into many of the key tissues that we need to treat in patients with Fabry disease. And it is hoped that because of that, it will treat the whole body. And one of the challenges of this approach is you're not gonna be able to get all of the cells in any organ targeted. So the cells that do take up the construct and start producing this gene are going to have to overproduce probably at least 10 times as much as would be needed in the natural setting for a given cell so that the, the enzyme leaks out in sufficient quantity to supply the surrounding cells. But it is a very cool idea. And in the animal model, you can see the data on this. In the animal model, you're going from practically no expression um, to wild type levels or sometimes above wild type levels. And this, this was not done on a cell by cell basis. This was done on a tissue basis. So in the mouse, in the brain, in the mouse liver, and in the other tissues that they looked at and biopsied, they were able to get expression high enough to supply the whole organ with adequate enzyme. Now, unfortunately, it is easier to do that kind of thing in an animal the size of a mouse than it is in a person. Not only is there more tissue in a person, but the defenses of our bodies are more sophisticated. The things that regulate genes and uh, turn them on and off are more sophisticated and more targeted in people. So we'll have to see how well this works in people, but this is a very good start. This one um, is a little bit different this is also using an AAV9 vector, but in this case, they did not drop in a whole copy of the alpha galactosidase A gene. What they wanted to do was be able to fix the native copy of the gene. So they took something, it's not the same as CRISPR-Cas9, but it's basically a similar mechanism. And they put together a two-target, a two-vector process with an AAV8 and an AAV9, and it goes in to the cell, and, and then each of those has a gene in it that produces another protein, and that induces a clipping out of the abnormal place where there's only one letter changed in the gene, but that creates a splice site that shuts down the gene uh, or decreases the enzyme activity. And so what they do is cut out that one letter and replace it with the correct letter. And that's a pretty slick thing. And there are probably a lot of times when we would want to do that um, in fixing particularly some of the, the genetic conditions besides Fabry disease. I mentioned that um, 
in Fabry disease, the enzyme that we're that's missing is not um, bound to a membrane, so it doesn't stay in a specific part of the cell. Um, well, it does in the lysosome, but it's not sort of stuck in place. Some enzymes have to be attached to a membrane to work. So in order to get those into cells, it's going to be much more practical to go in and fix the mutation in the genes um, for, for at least some of those proteins than it is going to be to try to drop in a whole new copy of the gene. So this is a very exciting concept. There are some um, governmental issues with this though. Currently in Europe and in the United States, if you change um, something about a treatment, you have to go through the whole process as though it's a whole new drug. And it costs about a half a billion dollars to get a drug, each drug to market. The problem with this approach, this particular one, which technically is super cool, and I, and I really am jealous of the people who were able to come up with it, um, is that every mutation would require that investment start to finish, and that's just cost prohibitive. Now, the particular mutation targeted for this experiment is very, very prevalent in Taiwan. So most of the patients with um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in Taiwan have that mutation and a late onset form of Fabry disease. So in that place, it may be, this may be a good, a good approach. For people who have a mutation causing their Fabry disease and their family is the only known family with that mutation, this approach is, is currently just too expensive to be even considered um, as a practical approach to treatment. If we could get the FDA to say, well, the concept is sound, the safety is sound, and we can get this to work efficiently enough, then maybe we could use it and be able to customize it to any individual in, uh, mutation. But we would have to change the legal process in a substantial way to do that. Okay. Um, oh, this is this is one that I thought was really, really cool. So they took an AAV administered enzyme, which is not a new idea, but they looked at it and they said, well, we're going to put this in and we know we can't target every cell in the body. We know that this enzyme is going to have to be exported and go through the circulatory system and picked up by the cells. And when we put enzyme alpha-galactosidase A into the body currently for enzyme replacement therapy, the infusions, most of the enzyme gets inactivated before it gets taken up by cells. So we lose a lot of enzyme just in that transition because alpha-galactosidase A is at its best in a pH that is very acidic. And our blood is not acidic. The lysosomes in our cells are, but the blood that we have to get through to get to the cells to then be in that environment is not very acidic. So we need to, um, so they decided that they would modify. They're not gonna make the native enzyme not gonna replace that gene. They're gonna modify the gene to make something that will stay stable as it goes through the neutral pH in our blood and deliver active enzyme at higher efficiency. 
And the preliminary data that you can see on this slide supports that quite robustly. So this allows, this kind of an approach allows us to customize proteins so that if there is a protein that causes too much reaction, allergic reaction, we can take the active part of that protein, try to redesign the framework around it so that it's not so immunogenic or so it's stable in the blood system or so it has other properties that we want. Okay, and this one is another one that's in clinical trials. Those others were in animal trials, preclinical now. This is another one that's in clinical trials, taking lentiviral uh, vectors. So they harvest stem cells, treat them when they can show that they are producing the enzyme and then they are stabilized, then they use busulfan as a preconditioning um, agent to shut down the bone marrow to some extent. Then they put in the new stem cells and the new stem cells then have space to grow in because the bone marrow has been partly shut down. And then those cells go out and specialize into white blood cells, glial cells, and other cell types that the body needs um, that come through the hematologic system. And they produce the enzyme in the places where those cells live, which turns out to be most of the places that we need to target for treatment of Fabry disease. So this is looking also very promising, but still on the early side, there are 10 to 15 patients that have been treated to date. Additional patients are being recruited as we speak. And we're looking at you know, a few years before we'll be able to really decide how effective is this, but it's looking very promising. So some other genetic manipulations that are worth watching for. RNA-based treatment. So instead of dropping in a gene, we drop in RNA, it goes into the cell and just takes over the protein making mode and produces the protein. You have to be retreated about once every two to three weeks, but it doesn't produce this, the enzyme outside of the cells. So you don't get the infusion reactions that you get with, um, with um, ERT and you get better distribution of it. Liposomes as a vector, which has a lot less reactivity than using the protein coding of viruses, but currently isn't quite as efficient in getting the DNA into the um, nucleus of the cell. Another thing that is being looked at is immunomodulation. So shutting down the immune system as you do the gene therapy, just temporarily, and then allowing that to, to regenerate. And the benefit that that has is one, it decreases the chance that your body will have an immune response to the new protein that it's making. And two, it leaves open the possibility of retreatment. And that's just starting to be studied, but very exciting because if you get a partial treatment with a gene therapy currently, you cannot retreat safely. But with this immunomodulation, we may be able to do multiple treatments in cases where that's needed. So conclusions. Gene therapy is in a very active research phase right now. I think there are at least 15 groups actively pursuing different forms of gene therapy for Fabry disease. It is very likely to become a true treatment option and the comparison to current treatments will be needed, but currently it's looking promising that it will be equivalent or possibly even better um, at some point. 
Uh, risks for off-target genetic changes are going to need to be monitored. We hope that this will be a one-time treatment that lasts a lifetime and that we will get adequate quit tissue and cellular penetration for all of the target tissues needed. And we'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Hopkins. So Donna's with us now. She's going to uh, give you a few questions that have come in. Hi, Donna. Hey. Hello. Sorry for Let my- Let me stop sharing so we can see who's, who's up and talking. All right, cool. So the good news is, is that I got to see the part of the town hall on Fabry disease and learn more about the new package indication for Fabrizyme that starts at age two. The bad news is, <laughs> is exciting news. The bad news is that I missed the start of your talk. Uh, uh -huh. Time zone fun. Okay, so I have one very interesting question to start with, which is not from me, but it's from Jen. Um, she's trying to understand a little bit better the implications for gene therapy for her 18 year old. Uh, she wondered if um, doing gene therapy would alter his sperm so he wouldn't pass on Fabry disease, and also uh, their implications for his fertility with gene therapy. So the current gene therapy trials are specifically avoiding treatment of the germ cells, the cells that make sperm and eggs. So it would not alter the genetics of his offspring, he would be able to pass on his genes, presumably, but would not um, be those, his children would not be protected uh, from inheriting Fabry disease. So daughters would be expected to have Fabry disease, sons would not have Fabry disease because it's a son. I mean, it's a, a father. Um, women who had gene therapy could pass on Fabry disease to either sons or daughters at a 50% risk. Now, busulfan can, well, busulfan and other Im immunosuppressants, which are used in all of the forms to date of gene therapy, can result in decreased fertility. How big of a problem is that going to be? We don't know. We do know that not everybody is infertile who gets treated with those drugs. Um, the gene therapy itself would not interfere with fertility, but the um, immunosuppression that we do before gene therapy may in some cases uh, have impacts on fertility. If you're worried about that and you're going to be getting um, gene therapy, there are actually some things that you can do to preserve germ cells, and those are available for both men and women, and you would need to talk to your local uh, reproductive endocrinologist or uh, urologist or uh, obstet obstetric gynecologist. Uh, to get those things. I believe that um, Avrabio, um, as part of their their trial, because they use busulfan or similar medications, um, give the option of banking sperm as you join their trial. So that's something that's kind of built into their study. So yeah. something, you know- It is something that we are very much aware of, keeping an eye on and trying to be, you know, trying to, gather information on, but we don't know, we haven't treated enough people to really know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's another question which you partially answered, but maybe you can expand on it a little bit. Um, if you have unsuccessful gene therapy, could you do it again or would there be a problem? So currently, if you use an AAV um, based gene therapy, which is the majority of the current uh, projects that are being done, um, it would be quite dangerous to retreat because your body will generally uh, have produced some antibodies, not necessarily to the alpha galactosidase A, but to the vector that's used to take the gene therapy into your body. 
So that would be problematic. However, at the world meeting this year, and I did not include any, didn't pull that data um, for this talk, but they had at least two different groups who are trying um, ways of decreasing that immunogenicity, uh, different ways of doing that so that you will have the option to retreat. And in principle, the lentiviral approach could be retreated. However, you would have to do the busulfan, uh, which is a pretty major drug, a second time to do that as well. So there would be some potentially associated um, risks with that. Okay, uh, we've got another question from Vera. She says uh, she's new to this all. She was just diagnosed with Febre. Her father was diagnosed in 1962, but died in 1986. So he never could take gene therapy. Um, her son and his wife just had a baby born 20th of December and the stem cells from the umbilical cord were saved. And her son wants to know if is it possible to use those stem cells for treatment in any way? For that, for that child? For her. For her. Yeah. Um, we don't know. And right now that would be probably, probably not with the current abilities to use stem cells. Even if the child is a close enough match um, it would be hard because we don't have the ability to pre-program the cells to go into the right place and become the cells that replace the damaged ones in your body. So that we're a ways away from that. Cool. Thank you. Um, a question from Christy. Are there any clinical trials for gene therapy that are recruiting females at this time or will be in the future? So at this time, I do not know of any that are, that are open and recruiting, but yes, um, there are at least two groups who are actively planning uh, trials that, that they are, I mean, they have to negotiate with the FDA and the EMA so it's hard to say what the final plan will be, but the plans currently are moving forward with the idea that we must include women in treatment de development in Fabry disease. And so, yes, there will be some that are, and they're looking for ways of measuring uh, the impact of the gene therapy. Um, one company in particular, I think, has an amendment out to the institution review board. So those are the committees that review protocols to make sure they're safe for humans to participate in. So um, that should be coming out in the next couple of months. Yeah, I know at least two companies are working on that actively right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's it's not one of those things where we're saying, oh, eventually they're going to have women in. It's like, it's no, it's it's going to be soon. Um, and that is it for the questions in chat. Does anybody else have any other questions that you can raise your hand and ask directly, or I'm happy to read them off the chat. I think um, the other question that, that I haven't seen asked quite yet is, you know, we talk about classic and non-classic Fabry disease. Are there any of the trials that are open soon for non-classic Fabry disease as well as classic? Um. There are some that are being, again, the, the, when you get past, so the, in, in clinical trials, you go through a phase one. The big question on phase one is, is this crazy? And really what you wanna know is, is this so dangerous that we should just stop here and say, no, we're not gonna do this. Now they do have secondary endpoints that look at, does it look like it's helpful and does it, is it being productive? Um, and then the phase two, you start to ask, is there some benefit from this? But the major issue in phase two is also safety. And in the phase one, two, two area, 
they are look they have been specifically limiting to um, and usually in rare diseases you do phase one and phase two as a combined single study and they have specifically used classical patients because they want to be able to show that they are producing the enzyme and that it is getting to levels that are in the tissues at high enough to be therapeutic. And that's a lot easier to do when you have a enzyme level at baseline of zero because it's easy to compare things to zero. If you have a partial enzyme activity, it's much harder to do that. Same thing for the biomarkers, lysogl 3 in classical males is around 100. In some of the late onset varieties of Fabry disease, it might be five or six. Um, it's a lot harder to show you've had a big impact when you're starting at five than it is when you're starting at 100. So because of that, the initial phase where they're trying to prove that their principle is correct and that they are doing something has been um, really focused on uh, classical and predominantly male patients. When you get to phase three and you're talking about who you will be able to sell this drug to if it works, you need to expand your market. And they will want to be able to market to non-classical patients and women because those two groups make up the majority of people with Fabry disease. So they will expand to those, to include those. Thank you. Any other questions? Anybody want to raise their hand or unmute? Ask Dr. Hopkins anyone. Uh, how many? We have a question. How many phases are in a clinical trial? Good question. So there are phase one, phase two, phase three are human trials. Before that, you have a couple of different phases that are preclinical. So when you're doing animal and tissue culture experiments, those are both required. Um, and those are sort of pre-phase one. Then, then you have phase one, two, and three. If your phase three is successful, then you go into phase four, which is post-marketing. And during that time, you're able to sell your product but you have to select at least some of the patients being treated and follow them. And the big question on a phase four clinical trial is are there late complications that impact safety and is the duration of treatment adequate with the treatment that you've given? And so how long, how long does it work for? And for the first generation of people treated, the phase four is gonna go, I think at least 30 years, which is a long time, but it's not a time. The reason you could, I said before, you can't do a 40 year trial is if you're doing a phase one or a phase three even, you can't market your drug during that time. And if you're spending hundreds of millions a year to do the trial and you do that for 40 years, you're gonna be bankrupt before you get to sell your drug. Once you get to the point that you can market the drug, if the drug is working well, you can do, you not only can, but should do follow-up studies to try to refine the treatment and the understanding of the drug and its action. Um, for as long as you're marketing the drug, you should keep monitoring it to make sure that you're optimizing the use of the of the treatment. And right now with these gene therapy trials, they're combining some of the phases. 
So one study might be one, two to see how safe and if it works a little bit. Another one might be two, three, which looks how effective it is. So it's interesting when you have a small amount of patients, you get these phases like squished together, uh, which is where we and are. The, and the, the, they're also subdividing. So you might have phase 1A, 1B, 1C, because they're looking at different doses or different dosing regimens um, for those. Uh, so it's with the gene therapy, because you are changing the underlying physiology in your body, you're changing the way your body works with the treatment in a permanent way, um, it's making it so that the phase one, phase two, phase three organization isn't very clean and may not even be meaningful. So that's that's going to be uh, something that we're also not that you guys don't necessarily need to pay attention to, but Don and I do and figure out how that's going to shake out and is it going to change the structure of clinical trials um, and if it does, how's it going to do that? And how can we optimize that system to get people access to any treatment that works as soon as possible, but not expose them to unnecessary risk? Which leads us very nicely into the, the, I think, our last question of the night, um, which is how far out from here are we to get a valid option as gene therapy? Five years more? And once it's offered to us, how do we go about advocating to get it? Which doctors would we go to get to see to get this? So that that is a complicated question. Um, I think it will be at least five years, probably more than that. Um, honestly, I'll be a little surprised if we have gene therapy outside of clinical trials in less than ten years from now. It, in theory, is possible, but I would would be a little surprised. Um, once it does get offered, um, anybody who is a true specialist in Fabry disease should be able, they, want, they might not be offering the gene therapy, but they should be able to find out who is and be able to direct you to those people. And it will be a complex negotiation because you're going to want people to do it, but you have to be set up um, in specific ways and have all of the specialists that are needed and the facilities that are needed and the ability to do the monitoring that is needed to do gene therapy. So not every hospital is gonna be set up for that. So you probably would have to go to a major medical center and they would then have to have a contract and agreement with the manufacturer of the gene therapy that you're dealing with um, in order to get that up and running. And right now, we haven't built the infrastructure to do that yet, so it's kind of a black box. Earlier, when we showed the slide about um, for the industry companies, so at least for the three that we're kind of keeping track of at the moment, um, Avrobio, Sangamo, and 40MT, if you go into that grid I showed you and select the um, more information, and you'll see contact information. So in addition to going through your own physician for information, you can go to the numbers that they provide in those three grids and find a starting point if you're interested. And, and just like for the therapies we have now, the clinical trial participation is extremely important to get where we finally want to be. So I participated in Averizon three, four, um, phase three, four uh, studies and so it, it just takes, so if you're at all interested, you know, think about participating in a trial and that'll get us uh, to where we'd like to be with more um, potential options for our future. So think about that. Right. So, and just so you'll know, phase three and four tri clinical trials 
are generally fairly safe. Not 100% guaranteed, but they're generally fairly safe. Phase one, two clinical trials have more risk, but if you need something done now and you're not doing well on your current therapy, they might be worth thinking about. There is a requirement for the companies and for the local principal investigators to give you complete enough information about the trial that you understand the risks and the benefits before you make a decision. So they have to be willing to give you information. If there's openings and they would consider you, you are not obligated, but they have to be willing to give you the information on the study. And ask the companies, ask the doctors, and if your doctor isn't doing it, ask your doctor to refer you to people who are going to be working in the clinical trials, if you're, if you're really interested in that. They pay for travel, so it's not as if you're going to, you know, if you're going to Cincinnati, you've got to pay your own way. They'll cover things like that. Some of the trials offer travel, so uh, um, I don't remember which ones, if, if not all. But, so we have one more thing to do before we uh, finish tonight. And we're going to do the prize drawing. Dr. Hopkins, thank you so much for a great uh, presentation. And uh, I learned, I, there's a lot I don't know, but I learned a lot that I didn't know about this. And, uh, and, I, and I've been keeping track of it fairly well. So great job on your presentation. That's not surprising that I learned something. But um, we need to do our prize drawing for tonight. So uh, I think this applies to only the, the uh, primary attendees, meaning uh, people with Fabre, family members, and caregivers. So Dawn is going to tell you a, uh, what secret, what word you're going to type in the chat box. And once we get all those, uh, that, all that input in, then uh, Brenda is going to calculate the winner for our prize drawing. So uh, what's the word, Dawn? The word is gene therapy. So it's actually two words. So gene therapy, if you are interested in being entered in the prying and you're in the drawing and you are um, a primary participant. Go ahead. I see okay, that. So we see the answers coming in. We'll give you a second mm -hmm. to- They're rolling in. For everyone to get in there. And then Brenda, are you ready when we're ready? Brenda? I am. I'm just uh, copying the names here. Sorry. I knew you were there somewhere. <laughs> I'm enjoying the fact you all are spelling gene therapy right. And I even got a smiley face along the way. So <laughs> <laughs> watch the chat sometimes. I think we're all in. Any late, late ones in? All right. Rolling has stopped. It's like the wheel of fortune, except. Well, Brenda is using a uh, random number generator to calculate who the winner is. There, there was one more question while they're doing the calculation. Sure. Will they ever offer clinical trials to males under 18? Mm -hmm. Currently, there are clinical trials for males under 18, but not for gene therapy, but for treatment of Fabre disease. And there are additional ones being planned. And I had a meeting a few days ago in which I was asked, what would my ideal approach be to gene therapy for Fabre disease. And I said, newborn screening, find out they have Fabre disease, treat them before age two and have them grow up wondering why they have to go to this stupid doctor because I'm not mm -hmm. sick. That's yes. my goal. <laughs> Good idea. That sounds great. So I think we will get there, but it will be a while. I better get, I better plan on a couple more organ replacements. <laughs> Let's just keep the ones you have, Jerry. Come on. <laughs> what you got? <laughs> My heart is good for a long time now, but I don't know about the rest of me. <laughs> Brenda, how are we doing? Um, there was a, a quick question, which was, 
Um, can we view this presentation later from the archive menu? And the answer is yes, that will be up there. Okay, I just sent Don the winner's name. Here we go, I'm putting it up. Ah, Janine, you have won the fabulous prize. So we will- Janine, you're the winner for tonight. your way. So we will, uh, we will email you just to verify that we have the correct address. And, uh, and then once we do that, we'll send you. And I don't know if we're delinquent and getting, did we get you yours out there, Jorge, yet? No. Okay, we'll make sure we get that early in the next couple of days. I wasn't sure Susan had done that yet. All right, we'll take care of that. Thank you all so much for attending. Um, in a couple of days, the registration link for this meeting will um, be taken down and the new one for the next meeting will be uh, put on the registration page. So thanks so much. And we've got, uh, we only have 18 more, so hang in there. Good night, thanks everybody. everybody. <laughs> 7.30 Eastern Standards. <laughs> I don't know why the, the link, Jerry, is always showing up for me at 8.30. Sorry, say that again. The link to the meeting keeps showing up at 8.30 on my calendar. Is it there, the recording? No, oh, the recording is going. But the every time that I look at my calendar, the calendar invite is all for 8.30. <laughs>